welcome back to Wine Bob. Thanks for joining. Today we're going to be going over the wines we'll be tasting later in the week, and those are the 2013 Marqueterie Scal Rioja Reserva and the 2016 Igui Gal Cote Rome. These are particularly special wines because I think aside from being part of a region that actually tends to have a lot of value in it, uh, these are also wines that I think will help illustrate how we can use the classification that the EU uses to kind of decipher the different wines in the different regions all across Europe. Uh, they can get rather complicated because in each country you're going to have slightly different language that's going to be used to describe the same things. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and show how the EU classification carries over into the different uh, wine regions. Um, and also, like I said, there's great value in these regions. You can get Riojas that show fantastic quality at the 20 to $30 price point. And same in the Cote Rhone. At the Cote Rhone entry level uh, Rhone Valley wines, you can get fantastic wine from fantastic winemakers that have such a long history in the region for 20 to $30 a bottle. Uh, and it's not something you're really gonna see in a whole lot of different wine regions in the world. So if you're ready, let's jump into the nitty gritty of wine labels. First, let's have a quick refresher on geography and respective wine laws. If you recall, the old world refers mostly to Europe. There are two terms that will be helpful as we compare wine laws across Europe and they are protected designation of origin, or PDO, and protected geographical indication, or PGI. These are terms used by the European Union to describe demarcated wine regions. We will use this as our baseline when looking at other countries' respective wine laws. With the Cote de Rhone being in France and Rioja being in Spain, there is going to be a difference in geographical label vernacular. If you recall from earlier, Wines from France may be released as either Vin de France, which has the lowest level of regulation, or Vin de Pai, VDP, and Indication Geographic Protégé, IGP, which are wines from more specific geographical subregions in France that may not adhere to the local regulations. These are considered a protected geographical indication, PGI. And finally, Appalachian Controles, the AOCs, which are wines with a specified subregion in France that is held to the strictest regulations. These are considered protected designation of origin, or PDO. So what is an appellation? An appellation is a regulated regional designation which guarantees a wine's indicated geographical origin, or put more simply, where the hell it's from. Let's take a look at how this pertains to our bottle. Looking at the label, you can see that this wine is from the Appalachian Côte du Rhône, which is a regional appellation of the Rhone Valley, meaning that this wine's grapes may have originated from practically anywhere in the vineyard area between Vienne in the north and Avignon in the south. This appellation covers the production of Rouge, Rosé, and Blanc wines. There are more specific designations in the Rhone, such as Côte du Rhône Village and Cru designations that are associated with higher levels of quality in the Rhone Valley. But for today, we are just going to focus on the entry-level designation as it pertains to the wine we'll be tasting later in the week. That being said, let's take a closer look at the Cote de Rhone. But specifically, let's look at what the hell's in it. According to the INAO, which is the governing body of the appellation system, wines under the appellation must contain a minimum of 15% Syrah and or Mouvedre in addition to a minimum of 40% Grenache. Additionally, if the wines come from north of Montelimar, then the wine can be a Syrah dominant blend where the minimum of Grenache is reduced. This is particularly important since E. Gigal produces their wines through their chateau in Ampouy, which is located in the far north of the Rhone Valley. This is evident on the bottle here at the bottom. Having looked up the text sheet for this particular wine, I can easily confirm that the proportions year to year are somewhere in the ballpark of 50% Syrah, 40% Grenache, and 10% Mouvedre, which matches the regulations of the region. So let's check out the whiff and the wit on Spain. Spanish wines can be released as Vino de la Tierra, which is the base PGI designation which is the equivalent of the Vin de Pie or Indication Geographic Protégé in France. Next is the Denomination d'Origine, which is the equivalent to the Appellation Controle System in France, or the PDO level if you recall. There are two regional designations above these, 
The Denominación de Origen Calificada is a designation that recognizes the consistent high quality of a region's wine. In all of Spain, there are only two. They are Rioja and Priorat. The reason for the difference is letter in lettering is that Priorat recognizes the Catalan verbiage. Lastly, there are Vinos de Pago, which are application only, have stricter regulations, and are awarded to individual estates that meet the proper criteria. So where the hell is it from? According to our wine label, this wine is from El Ciego, which is covered by the Rioja Denominación de Origen Calificada. This region is authorized for the pr production of red, white, rosé, and sparkling wine, which leads us to the next part. What the hell's in it? According to the Ministry of Agriculture in Spain, Tempranillo, Mazuelo, Graciano, and Garnacha must comprise 85% of this blend. Though typically in practice, Tempranillo is the dominant varietal. Depending on how the wine is aged, it will fall into a corresponding age aging category. These categories are Hoven, Crianza, Reserva, Gran Reserva, and Gran Añada for sparkling wine. As you can see, the label is clearly marked here, which means that it has been aged at least three years, including at least one of those years in a 225 liter oak barrel. Although French barriques are becoming more common in use, American oak is the traditional barrel of choice, which can lend notes of dill and coconut in addition to normal oak characteristics. Referring to the text sheet for this wine, I found that it spends around two years in American barrels and the rest has been spent in the bottle. That's almost five years of bottling condition. In addition, this particular bottling is a Tempranillo Graciano blend where Graciano rarely exceeds 10% of the blend from vintage to vintage. Now I know that's a lot to take in, and honestly these Mondays are going to be a little on the thicker side because a lot of it's going to be this decoding of wine labels, but it's going to get you ready for the wonderful wines that we get to taste later in the week. And I'm really excited about these wines like I told you earlier because there's such great value in these places. To have a bottle that's seven years old at this point that's gone under this extensive aging cycle that only costs about 20 bucks is insane. You're not really gonna get that kind of pedicure anywhere else in the world. Rioja is kind of like this hidden gem where you just get to play around with these really insane bottlings. They've got a lot of different producers that do it too. So this isn't the only bottle that you can get where you see this type of aging, this type of conditioning that's gonna be happening over multiple years. As far as Cote is concerned, you have a lot of versatility in this region because of how open the regulation is to different grape varietals where you can get wines with a higher degree of elegance. You can get wines with a higher degree of power, more tannin, more acid, and play around with these different structure profiles, uh, which again is kind of a rare thing to find as well. So you can pay $20 for one bottle that kind of drinks like a Cabernet Sauvignon, or you can pay $20 and get a bottle that's gonna drink a little bit closer to a Pinot Noir. There's a lot of versatility there that are all fall under the Cote de Rhone uh, appellation system. So I look forward to being able to play around with these wines with you in the future. But again, we just laid the groundwork for what we're gonna be enjoying later in the week and I can't wait to share these with you. If you have any questions about any of the information that I covered today, or you would like to make suggestions about future videos, please feel free to drop a, a comment in the comment section. Otherwise, please subscribe, please share with your friends, and I look forward to sharing wine with you later in the week. Cheers.